page. And then you pass it around to the next person and they have to either add on ideas to that or um, you know, extend one of the ideas that you have. And so you do that until the paper gets all the way around. One of the things that I've found that works well for this one is that it really gets everybody to participate. Because sometimes in brainstorming, even though you're not supposed to critique other ideas, <coughs> A lot of times there's a couple of people dominating what's going on in the brainstorming session. So this actually gives everybody an opportunity to participate um, during that. And then you have the ideas all captured related to that. Another thing that you can use, and we actually have these cards. Um, they were developed by a group where they looked at what were the common strategies, and these work primarily for product design. They looked at what a lot of um, industrial designers, this, the main strategies or heuristics that they use in doing design. So they will, um, and there's a, we have a card of 76 of these. And so you can take a look at them. So they describe how you might take a design and then morph it um, to like apply an existing mechanism in a new way, which is really helpful but the thing that I actually find most useful is then it also shows me how it's been incorporated in, pro in real prod products. So that has been helpful. And so anytime I've had trouble with ideation, I've actually been used, have used these cards and they've actually really helped me think about different ways of doing, you know, extending my idea. And um, where I, I don't think that I'm usually very good at ideation, but this helps a lot with that. So we have these cards that you can use as well. So brainstorming are ways to kind of expand that space. But then at the end, we do have to make some decisions about which of the options we're going to pursue. So how do we do that? How do we do the, the convergence to be actually then to narrow that. So one of the strategies you might use is a decision matrix. How many have seen decision matrix before? Okay, fair number. So um, basically it can help you organize the information and make a decision based on uh, the data, the information that you have. So i um, show you an example here. So the criteria you would put it along the, in the different rows. And for each of these, we actually can assign different weights because all the criteria for our project may not be of equal value. Some things might be critical, very important. Some things might be nice. So there's a way to do that. You actually then assign scores to the different options that you're considering. And then you multiply the weight by the score to, and then add those up and you get a total. So where, if we're thinking about our projects, what would we use for the criteria for comparison? Where should that come from? Specifications, Specifications yes. Okay, if we want to know what it is and how to make the best decision, we're going to want to base it on the specs. If it's important enough to be included in our weighted decision matrix, it should be captured in our specifications. Because I've heard people talk about projects and they may say, well, we went with this option and they give a reason that's not included in the specs. If it's important enough to inform your decision, you should have it listed as a specification. So that's kind of a check too to see as you go through making these decisions. So you might have seen this example, getting a job, and you're trying to decide you've got four job offers, and you can't decide which one of those to pick. So you're really mulling over this situation. Um, and you've assigned, you've identified some criteria that are important. And you can assign then weights to each of these. So then you multiply the weight by the score and add it up to the total here. 
And you might take a look at this. So if this were you, and you came up with this kind of weighted decision about jobs, how might you use this to inform your decision? Do you definitely just go with company A? No, why not? Well, how I feel about it is also important. And plus, since company B performed so well in every category. Right. Do we know that this is actually accurate enough to say that that absolutely is one? No. So this can be used to help organize it. However, what might you probably be able to say related to this? Company D, probably not to go further. So I would want to get more information, too, related to the different companies on um, which one I, I wanted to uh, pursue, because it was so close. So it is a tool that you need to be able to also, it needs to align with your understanding. If there's some aspect here that it isn't reflecting, you either need to go back and include that criteria in your specifications or get more information, okay? These are great things, though, to show about how you made decisions. So in two weeks, you're going to be doing design reviews. And one of the key things about showing, and even on a weekly basis, especially those of you who are like presenting your work every week, how did you make your decision? What information did you use? That is as important as the decision you make. So being able to show that process is actually really, really uh, valuable. OK. So actually, for some of the detailed design, this becomes pretty project specific. There are some general guidelines you can use. But the actual you know, technologies and things like that um, are things that um, you know, are really very specific to your project. So we're not going to talk about that. Some of the ways of approaching design, though, as far as like top-down specification, bottom-up implementation, those are strategies that can often be effective across technologies. So you want to be able to find interfaces between your different sub-projects so that you know when you need to line up the two components that they're actually going to fit. Or when you have one piece that's going to be communicating information from another subroutine, that you actually know what information you need to do. So those are strategies that can apply across. We'll talk about DFM, DFMEAs as another tool that you can use in design, and detailed design. And again, we continue to prototype and field test, do usability testing. So DFMEA it stands for Design for Effects, Modes, and Analysis. And basically what you're trying to do is identify risk, potential risk to your product design and design um, and, and mitigate that risk through an improved design. So you can go through an analysis to see what are our potential failures. And then what can you design into your product to mitigate this? So this particular example is looking at, I believe, like a um, tub for a washing machine. And there's one sensor, but if that sensor were to fail, what would happen with overflow of water? So what could you do to design to mitigate that? Even software projects, you know, we can look at what would be kind of uh, ways in which we can design our system should maybe the authentication program go down or some other kind of um, aspect related to that. So you actually brainstorm all potential failures. You rank them based on the severity of what will happen should it occur, uh, the, how frequently it will occur, and how easy it is to detect. Because if something is really difficult to detect, it actually poses a lot more risk to things that are actually easily identifiable. So then you multiply those, and you get an RPN, and you can develop an action plan. 
So these are really good things to do. Once you have some design and you know that uh, you can evaluate what are the potential risks, you can use this. Now, once you have get these, you can rank them and, and actually then decide there are some parts that the risk is so low that we actually don't need to do anything for our design. But there are probably things that you identify that you do need to address. So this is a great exercise to go through, used in industry all the time, um, whether you're looking at product. The other way it's used often is looking at schedule. So what is the risk to this not getting done? So you can take what is the activity that is most the, the riskiest and most likely to keep me from being <coughs> successful and strategize plans to address that. So it might be bringing in other resources. It might be starting that part of the project early. Those are things that you can do. So you can actually use this analysis. This is for design, but there's a general failure mode effects analysis that can be used for schedule and, and other aspects related to a project. So this is something when you talk to industry, they'll definitely know about that. Um, strategies for user testing. So there's actually an optimal way. They've done research. So you know, should I have five users or 100 or one? Kind of an optimum point here is five. So if you think about different users and user testing, but there's lots of resources too, given different contexts, that information. If you have access to more than five users, you probably want to do some initial testing, improve it, and then do another round is actually a more effective way at doing that. Universal design, I just want to talk about this real quickly about, I think it's important to approach your projects. I think these are one of the values to kind of embrace the concepts of universal design. And it's motivated by a lot of factors. Part of it is making sure that um, people with disabilities have access, but actually it has a broader impact in being able to make sure it's um, something that will be accessible by as large of a market share as possible. So you can actually just really think about um, approaching the design that way. So there are seven basic principles associated with universal design, but it's equitable, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive, perceptible information, tolerance for error, a low physical effort, and size of space for approach and use. So um, these are things, too, that you're going to want to quantify. We can't just say it's, you know, there's low physical effort. We would need to define what that is. But there are actually tools available that can, knowing what that is, you can quantify what percentage of the population your project will be utilizable by um, versus, you know, are you restricting it to uh, a smaller set of people who can use your product? So one of the things that I think is one, a great example of equitable use, and I go back to this design um, often when I think about it. So this is the amphitheater at Bradford Woods where Camp Riley is. And so I don't know if you can see, but basically often if we had a person who used a wheelchair in this class right now, where could they sit? There, right? A couple of different places. Could not sit anywhere. This amphitheater is designed so people who use wheelchairs can be at any level. So there's access to every level. And within the design, there's basically these fold down seats so that a person who used a wheelchair could sit anywhere and it could be intermingled with people who don't use wheelchairs. So there's not this stigmatism of, if you're using a wheelchair, we got a couple of spots up there for you, but that's it. You can actually sit wherever you want. And it's not segregating people within that. So if you think about universal design, this is one of the best examples of you know, being able to do that. Um, and so it's useful for everybody. So there's not distinguishing. Anybody can come and use this space. 
Flexibility and use, again, thinking about a lot of different um, uses there. There's sometimes a challenge if it's too flexible. Sometimes it could be more difficult to use. But you really want to be able to accommodate as many people as possible. Simple and intuitive, again, issues related to that. I'm going to go through these. You can do that. I do think it's funny, though. Want things to be intuitive? Why do you think they have to label the store push? Yeah, a handle. So you want people to interact with things as they would expect. You expect to pull this. That's why they had to put push. So these are the kinds of things that happen. And I don't know if you do this, but now I'm always walking around thinking of seeing bad design, you know, as far as they, they're having to put that there, that sign, because this is really bad to use. Again, I even have this problem. My stove looks like the bottom one. But which one is easier? How can you organize information in a way that's more intuitive? Use your design to make your design, your, um, the interactions with your users better. You really want to think about that. Perceptible information, one of the key things here is feedback. It is really frustrating if you're out working with a program or a device and there's something wrong and it's not giving you any feedback related to that. Is it the battery dead or some other kind of information? Or is the product, you know, is your program going off and doing analysis? You probably want feedback to the user that it, we're going through the analysis some way. Otherwise, your user is not going to know about that. So you can do positive and negative kinds of things related to uh, users with that. Multiple modes of communication making sure that we can communicate with as many modes as possible, symbols, audio, tactile. You can use multiple to reach as many users as possible. Again, tolerance for error. You want to minimize the hazards, but then you also want to make recovery, or if something happens, have as least of an impact as possible. So some things that people do. You know, they design connectors, so there's one way to be able to connect it. There's an undo button if you've accidentally made a mistake. Or a dialog box that says, are you sure you want to delete this before you delete all the work that you've done, you know, on that thesis or paper or homework or things like that. Okay? All right. I'm going to stop here. I pretty much... I'll have all of these posted. Wait one second before you move. So the homework again. By next week, here's the link uh, for your attendance. Your name, ID, true for number one, and then sign it. And I think Ji Hong is somewhere, but we'll get here. She's going to be over there. I'll be up here to collect them. <laughs>